Hello viewers, I'm SB and welcome back to Total War Warhammer 2. Before we get started today, uh, the Noseplays pointed out in the comments of the last episode that a big sale started on Steam uh, right about the time I posted the first episode uh, on all kinds of Warhammer stuff, and it includes the Total War Warhammer series. In particular, of note, is that Total War Warhammer 1 is like $15 in the sale, and if you are at all interested in trying out these games, I think that's a spectacular price for that game. Just the core package of Total War Warhammer 1 is a lot of content, there's a lot of variation in it. I would strongly recommend picking that up if you think you even might enjoy this. Anyway, to the game at hand. So, I think we're in kind of a bad spot here. The auto-resolve losses really, really hurt us. Uh, I should not auto-resolve pretty much ever, I think is what I'm learning from that. So, our army's in a pretty bad spot. Obviously, no matter what, we're going to have to fall back to, uh, to the other province, the place where the recruitment building is, so that we can get some slayers through local recruitment. However, I was looking at this while I was setting up my recording rig, and I think, actually, we may have to fall back in a more serious way. We saw a single unit of Orc Biggins during the initial battle, and that's because everybody's army gets to start with some slightly advanced units, in much the same way that um, we got to start with Thunderers, which we could not currently build. However, the fact that we're seeing Biggins in this army means that he has the ability to recruit them now. The uh, Karakungor has the recruitment building that creates these, and the fact is I don't think we can beat an army that is largely composed of Biggins with just Slayers. Biggins have 38 attack, 28 defense, 42 weapon strength. All of which is slightly worse than the same stats on our Slayers, I believe. Yeah, 45, 33, 48. Slayers are pretty good units. However, Slayers have zero armor. Uh, and we can talk about why in a second. While Biggins have 50. In addition, these Biggins are going to be supported by Night Goblin Archers. Night Goblin Archers don't do a ton of damage, but all of their attacks have this poison debuff. If a projectile from a Night Goblin Archer hits any figure in a unit, every figure in the unit gets hit with this debuff for 10 seconds. So I think actually a unit of Slayers, like three units of Slayers against two units of Biggins being supported by Night Goblin Archers is a big, big loss for the Slayers. So I think what we're going to have to do here is fall back and develop some, some better military tech, get some more ranged units... Like, I don't think we can push forward any further. I think the losses in the auto-resolve broke, uh, broke our momentum. Uh, we're going to need more money, obviously. We're also going to need the surplus population necessary to actually put, uh, put another level on this keep. I think I want to go ahead and let Nashrax Lair finish building, but we have, the, we have the growth. We have this stuff coming in. It's just a matter of, first of all, not completely losing our army, and secondly, acquiring that cash. So, uh, to that end, we're going to remove this barley field here. Uh, I would expect that we're going to lose Kazadurkalaz, because we're going to fall back, obviously. We're going to fall back to our side of the province line. They will probably take back Kazadurkalaz, so there's no point in us trying to grow it. We'll just replace this with a basic money-making building. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wait until we have a little bit more military tech. It's not super satisfying. I would really have liked to resolve this quickly, again, because we have vampire civil war to worry about but i think this is really our only option at the moment i'm disappointed about it as well so what exactly is a slayer i realized that i talked a little bit about dwarves in general in uh, in the previous episode but i didn't talk about what a slayer is in warhammer lore and that's probably fairly important given that uh, first of all our army is made up of them and secondly our lord is the Slayer King. So basically, uh, dwarves obsess about things. It's kind of like their primary, the primary personality trait of the dwarves in Warhammer Fantasy is that they obsess about stuff. Obviously, this is where the grudges come from. Uh, if a dwarf suffers significant shame or guilt, then they that like destroys them from the inside out. Basically, they become unable to function. So in a situation like that, what they do is they take the Slayer Oath. They go to Karak Kadrin, to the great, the great Slayer Shrine, and they declare themselves Slayers. They exile themselves from Dwarf society, and uh, the only way they can think of 
to assuage their guilt or shame is to die gloriously in battle with something that is much stronger than they are. So they go out into the world and look for stronger things to kill them. Uh, now, it would be undwarf-like to just let yourself get killed. So they fight. They fight as hard as they can, and they just try to find something that can kill them. So you get troll slayers who just go out and hurl themselves into troll lairs, and if a troll can kill them, then great, their, their guilt or shame or whatever is expunged. Uh, and if not, then they kill the troll, and then they go and try to find a bigger troll lair. So that's what a slayer is. That's why they're not wearing any armor. Or clothing, in fact. Uh, and we can talk about the Mohawks in a second. First, a dwarf trade caravan is ringed by goblin wolf raiders. A stalemate has developed, but the foe refuses to relent. Such a local affray should be dealt with by the local lord, but your intervention could speed things up. So we could roll out and smash up these goblin wolf raiders, which seems like the thing to do. Oh, except it will lower public order. Why will it lower public order? So, like, leadership for our army is not super relevant because our slayers kind of ignore the effects of leadership anyway, and we certainly can't take a public order debuff given what's going on in our home province. Ah, clan politics in the region are complicated. In okay, so if we ride in and save the day, that shames the local leader who should be the one who... Okay, fair enough. Yeah. We'll leave them to deal with it. Leadership minus five does almost nothing to our army, and we could use public order, uh, a public order buff. The slayer in me seeks right. death. Yep, and so that's why Unger Iron Fist is always yes. saying things like, the slayer in me seeks death. Aye, I'll move. He too is a slayer. So these haircuts, all the slayers have these, uh, these crazy mohawks. I guess the deal is, you gotta shave, part of taking the Slayer Oath is you gotta shave the sides of your head and then wax up the rest of your hair with pig grease, which might also be part of the reason that Slayers are exiled, because nobody could stand to be around them due to the smell. Uh, and you gotta keep doing that, you gotta keep shaving your head and keep greasing up your hair as long as you're alive. So the taller a Slayer's mohawk is, the longer he has been a Slayer without dying. So I guess if you run into a Slayer with a really tall mohawk, you should try to like stay out of that dude's way. Um, so now we're back on our side of the line. We do have access to local recruitment of Slayers again. However, if we're going to dedicate ourselves to improving our military and economy for a little while, I don't know that I want to be paying a lot of extra upkeep. So how long would it take for a, a, uh, a money building to pay for itself? If it's operational for four turns, we will get positive money out of it. Do I think they will stay back for four turns? Yeah, maybe. I think that I think this might turn out to be worthwhile. And then in two turns we can do the same thing in Nashrax Lair, build another money building. Or we might actually build the die extraction building. Uh, we we do really need to make some friends. What's to the south of us? Oh, just there's more orcs. Okay, over here, Jufbar. Jufbar is a dwarf faction that we could maybe make trade with if we could clear the way. You know what we should do is we should try to send our army down here through the mountain pass toward Grand Peak and see if we can uh, open this up. Because if we can trade with Jufbar, that's going to help our economy tremendously. Especially with us having trade goods. Alright, let's go into march mode. We're going to head down in that direction as quickly as possible. We're not going to do any more recruiting, so our army is not really going to be... Uh, prepared for a big battle, but I just, I want to be banking money. So, we're already at one population surplus. We'll have two population surplus in six turns, and that's what it takes to get this to level three. Getting this to level three has a couple of big benefits. Uh, number one, obviously it unlocks another building slot, but number two, at settlement level three is where a lot of your advanced tech buildings uh, become available, like the ranger barracks, which let us recruit some more ranged attacking units, or the Armory, which will allow our basic recruitment building to produce great weapon troops. Because the, uh, the, like the basic sparring chamber can get you Dwarf Warriors. It can also get you Dwarf Warriors with great weapons, which are armor-piercing, uh, if you have an Armory. So we'll see what we want to do there. I'm not sure what my plan is, really, in the long term. For right now, I know we just want to focus on getting some troops that are capable of putting down biggins. And honestly, like Slayers are good fighters. Just improving the number of range troops we have and maybe getting some tougher guys to, to hold the line. Dwarf Warriors have 85 armor, so if we had some more Dwarf Warriors, we could have our Dwarf Warriors meet the Biggins face-to-face -face and then have Slayers come around the back 
They're uh, they're much more useful as attackers than they are as defenders. But I suppose, yeah, that's, that's all we have to do for this turn. Unfortunately, we're going to have a couple of turns here where we don't kill anything at all. And I apologize for that. It's not really in the spirit of the thing we're doing here, but uh, I made a bad decision and now we're paying the price for that. Auto resolves tough, because sometimes it behaves in a perfectly reasonable way, and other times it decides that all of your units should die for no reason in a battle that you clearly win. And you can never quite tell before pressing the button which one of those things it's going to be. Uh, we do need to keep, uh, keep an eye on the Vampire Civil War over here. My concern is that this faction, the Tempelhof, are going to get eliminated by Manfred von Karstein. And once Manfred von Karstein shares a border with us, uh, looks like we may not get the four turns I was looking for. Oh, they've gone into raiding mode. Okay, we'll talk about this. Uh, but uh, what I was saying is, once Manfred von Karstein shares a border with us, I expect him to be a threat. I don't know that he will immediately declare war. He's very bloodthirsty, but there's this climate system. You can see each settlement has a little circle to its right that informs you what climate type it is. I think this, with the, with the rolling hills and the trees, is like temperate. I guess we don't get to see the name of the climate. Uh, but basically, this is this is an unsuitable climate for us. We don't we don't build here that well. You can see our public order will be lower. Um, but we love we love these mountain climbs. The opposite is true for the vampires. The vampires love this sort of climate, and they won't like our lands. So it's possible that once Manfred von Karstein is victorious here, and I think the chances of that happening are basically a hundred percent. It's possible he'll prefer to go north and west toward more areas of this climate, and he'll just leave us alone. I wouldn't say we should count on it, but it might happen, so we might not have to worry about the vampires at all. Alright, one more turn before we can build in this second slot in Nashrak's lair. I am the Slayer King. Do I want to just, like, commit all the way? Here's the thing. We're much faster while we're in uh, march mode, but if we get attacked in battle, we can't retreat. And we will, uh, our army will simply be annihilated if we lose the battle. So I'm a little nervous about sticking my head out here too far. Because there could be an orc army in this area anywhere. Presumably they want to defend Mount Gunbad. I will stop just on our side of the province line. We are technically within our friendly province here. Which means that we, uh, we still get replenishment this turn. And I don't see anything hostile. This army should be sufficient to take Grom Peak if it's not guarded by another army. And if we can take Grom Peak, then we can make some kind of contact with Jufbar, probably. I guess I don't actually know how the regions are set up. So this region is Mount Gunbad. Okay. So the way trade works is you have to have a, a ground path. Uh, from your capital to the other faction's capital, or uh, from your capital to a port, and then to another port, and from that port to their capital. So if we want to trade from Karak Kadrin to Jufbar, we have to actually own this territory here, which means we'd have to have Mount Gunbad and Grom uh, Peak, because as you can see in the top left of this little area, this land right here is Mount Gunbad. That's not great. This army probably cannot take a walled settlement. Well, we'll see what's up. We can maybe just curry a little bit of favor with Jufbar by uh, picking off a weak army over here or something. All right, and we need 3,200 gold. Okay, we're extremely good on that. I actually could probably do a little bit of recruitment. Yeah, it's going to be quite a few turns. Uh, but I'm also going to build a... You know what? Let's not spend any money right now. I guess I can't do any recruitment because I marched. You can't uh, can't recruit after a full march. And we've picked up a new grudge. Under the outraged sight of Grimnir, the groby scum raid our mountains as they always have. Another grudge for the great book. Another wrong to be righted. More greenskins to hunt and kill. So we have to defeat Olug because he raided us, and that's very annoying. Uh, if we succeed, we will get plus five leadership for all of our armies for five turns. I've, that's pretty much useless. Also, 30 oath gold, which is fine. So what they're doing right now, uh, this little 95 here, indicates that they are siphoning off 95 gold 
from our income. They're, they are taking that. And they're causing some public order penalties, and they're causing growth penalties, and they're gaining fightiness. They're just kind of getting themselves generally psyched up by stealing and burning everything. It is a problem, sort of. I kind of don't care about Kazid or Kalaz right now. If they take it, they take it. Whatever, we gotta, we gotta fall back and build up a little over here. So actually, instead of building a money building in Nashrak's lair, actually, maybe this is where we should build our basic recruitment structure, and then we'll build the armory in Karak Kadrin, and that'll give us access to, uh, to good troops in this province. I guess we'll see how things look in a second. I don't know what the, uh, what the costs that we're talking about are for building those, uh, buildings. I also don't actually know which recruitment structure I want. Of course, there's the building that produces the Dwarf Warriors, and that would be valuable. But the ranged unit building is also the artillery building. And some artillery would be useful. A couple of bolt throwers will make those biggins a lot less dangerous. Alright, well, Templehoff seems to be holding their own for now. There are actually, I believe, three vampire factions down here in this area that all kind of started each other's throats. So it could be that Templehof will survive for a while because Manfred's off dealing with the vampires to the west. I don't know. We have precious little information about that part of the world. We could detach our runesmith from our army and have him run out there as a scout, and that actually might be worth doing. All right, Nashrax Lair. We are still at minus two public order. We could move our army back into one of the settlements, and uh, the army will raise the public order of the settlement well, as long as it's standing in there. Let's see. We can build the Cinnabar Mining Pit. Unfortunately, we have nobody to trade these dies to right now, so they wouldn't be terribly useful. Is there a thing we can build in the forge with just Oath Gold and die that's pretty cool? Let's see. We can make a Troll Slayer's Hide, which is magic resist armor. That's... Fine, I guess. It's like, that might be the only thing... Yeah, alright. Oh, we can recycle items we don't want anymore for Oath Gold. To war. Wait, do I have an extra shield? When did I acquire another shield? It gives Missile Parry and Damage Resistance. Uh, so the Missile Parry only works if your unit is shielded. Uh, this guy is not. So why don't... Is our Runesmith shielded? Also, no. If they're shielded, they have a little shield icon next to their hammer. Or next to their uh, armor. So I guess it's not particularly good on one or the other. What is the... What does the ability actually do? Oh, no, that's... Yeah, that's a thing you can just put up temporarily. It also just has five melee defense on it. To be perfectly honest, I like this shield better. So we'll keep this on Ungrim. We'll give the other shield to the other guy. And if we later turn out to be slightly short of Oath Gold for something, we can grind that th grind that shield up. It's not a big loss. Okay, back to focusing. So I think this is probably not the way we're going to go then. Uh, we could put up a money building here. I don't think that's a super valuable thing for us to do. Uh, we're definitely not going to increase the garrison strength of this city. I don't expect it to be attacked, and also we kind of can't afford to. So yeah, it really does come down to sparring chamber versus siege workshop. So a sparring chamber, I should mention, major settlements, the one major settlement in each province, can be upgraded all the way up to level 5. And you can see some of the buildings require the settlement to be high level uh, to get the maximum value out of them. The sparring chamber only requires the settlement to be able to make it up to level 3, and minor settlements can get up to level 3. So actually there's a lot of value in building our sparring chamber here, and saving the slots in Karak Kadrin for buildings that would like to be upgraded to 4 or 5. This will give us the ability to make dwarf warriors and also miners. Miners are pretty much just worse than dwarf warriors, but they do have armor piercing on their attacks, which is something, I guess. I think our Dwarf Warriors are mostly going to be for the purpose of holding people in place, not so much for the damage. We have Slayers for damage. 
We'll probably mostly build uh, dwarf warriors out of this. But once we have a little bit more balanced army composition, I'll, I'll feel a lot better about where we're going here. I do not want to upgrade this building. We want to save gold. Because we're going to want to build... I, this is going to take four turns to complete. So after we build this, we still have four turns worth of money making before we want to build that armory. So maybe I don't need to hold on to this. Maybe we should dismantle this and put up a money making structure instead. No, we want... My brain's all backwards. We want to maintain the growth until we can make the actual upgrade, at least. The slayer in me seeks death. And we have plenty of money with which to do a little bit of recruiting. We don't want to go nuts here, but we could, uh... Yes, we can maybe pick up a couple units of slayers and a couple units of dwarf warriors. What do you think? We gotta make sure we're gonna have 3,200 money for the upgrade. That's no problem. And then four turns after we make the upgrade, we're going to want to make sure we have 4,000 money. Oh, the armory also generates oath gold every turn. That's cool. And it increases the local recruitment capacity, so we'll be able to have... Uh, One rack. There will be four squares here. We'll Very be able to have four units well, coming in at the same work. time. I think we can afford to bring in three slayers now and then three warriors next turn. I think that'll be okay. And then once we have some warriors who can actually stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggins and enough slayers to flank around the backside... Oh, that's, uh, the Vampire Counts. That's Manfred von Karstein. Okay, so the, uh, the Vampire Counts are killing Tempelhof armies. We probably don't have too long until this is resolved, then. I'm kind of debating allowing Karak Kadron. Like, maybe we should switch the commandment allow the rebellion to happen outside of Karak Kadron and just have our army in place to put it down. Uh, public order increases for a little while after you, after you, uh, after a rebellion occurs, because all of the people who are unhappy join the rebellion, and then, presumably, you kill them. So, as, as, like, kind of deeply horrible as that is, maybe that's a reasonable play. Oh, this is an interesting thing that's happening here. An orc army fleeing from Jufbar has left itself exposed and weak. Well, I think we'll just pluck those guys, right? And it seems like uh, it seems like Olug is happy enough raiding here. He's going to let Kazadur Kalaz keep generating some money for us. I don't know how long it's going to take for that building to be worthwhile now because I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how the raiding uh, changes our income math. Like he's getting 106 money from raiding. But I don't know if that actually reduces our income by 106. It might be more, even, potentially. I have no idea. He's definitely reducing our effectiveness, but I'm afraid to go up there because he's got a big army, they've got another big army coming. Oh, we found a Teller of Tales. He gives plus one order in the local province and plus two untainted in the local province. And this untainted, this is corruption mechanic stuff. We'll, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more when it's vampire time. So this is a teller of tales that is following our rune lord now. I am the Slayer King. Also, our rune lord has gained enough passive XP from being in this army to gain a level. We're definitely headed for Rune of Wrath and Ruin as quickly as we can get it. Ready. Well, let's go win a battle, shall we? Tag them. I'm not technically at war with these orcs right now. I suppose. Oh. It's a good thing we looked over here. Yeah, I'm not technically at war with these orcs right now, and what I was thinking is, I suppose maybe that's a good thing because it means we don't have to worry about them coming up and attacking Nashrak's lair. Uh, and it appears that they're going to wipe out Jafar, probably. They took the capital. So maybe they're actually pretty powerful. Maybe it's a bad idea to declare war on them. No matter how much I would love to just kill an army for free. With this army being as weak as it is, we wouldn't really get a lot of money for doing so. I'm not gonna do yeah, alright. I'm going to leave them alone. We'll just head back north. It, given that these guys are not actually attacking Kazadur Kalaz... Eh, they're kind of making more goblins than I thought they'd be making. Yeah, maybe we can stand against these now that we, now that we can have a couple of warriors. Proper warriors. Uh, so you can see, great weapon, dwarf warriors require the armory. If we pin this, 
They compare like this to normal Dwarf Warriors. Normal Dwarf Warriors have 10 more weapon defense, but Great Weapon Warriors have a little bit more strength and a little bit more charge bonus. And what is not really represented here is that uh, the standard Dwarf Warrior uh, does 21 weapon damage and 7 armor piercing damage. Armor will reduce, I believe, by some percentage uh, the normal damage of the weapon, but the 7 armor piercing damage ignores that. Great Weapon Dwarves deal considerably more of their damage as armor piercing damage, and so they'll be... Uh, They'll get in less trouble when fighting things like biggins that have 50 armor or other dwarves that often have like 80 armor. That said, obviously, we're just going to get ourselves some warriors here. Warriors are cheaper than slayers as well, which is nice. Okay, so we need to have 3200 for Karak Kadron. That's going to be available to us in three turns. So we're actually, we're not going to have it if I do these hirings, because this is going to reduce our income by another 300. So do I not want to do this? This is tough. We're at a, we're at kind of an awkward moment here where uh, we have to choose between buildings and armies, and I think I choose buildings? Even 831 is a little lower than I would like. Yeah, all right. Let's let's do a little hiring. Let me think. As it is right now, this will leave us at about plus 700. So we'll make 2,100 more over the next couple of turns. That's fine. That's fine. We'll make the... Uh, we'll make the one additional Dwarf Warrior. And then maybe we'll head up... They're being so slow to move to Kazadurkalaz that maybe we can get up here and defend it still. I'm honestly not even sure if that's the right thing to do, and it's going to kind of depend on whether they try to attack it with just one of their armies or if they move both in. If they... There's some chance that we could set up an ambush. Like, go up to the... Uh, go up to near the city and then have our army sit in ambush mode outside of it with the intent of catching them when they try to walk into what appears to them to be an undefended minor city. Of course, the danger there is if they detect us, then they might attack us with both armies. Yeah, sorry, Jafbar. So this uh, this bar here underneath the faction indicates how, how strong the game re uh, regards our total armies against how strong the game regards their total armies as being. It thinks they will win a, uh, a protracted war right now, and I kind of have to agree. I'm a little worried about the uh, the tech disparity. It's all right. It's a thing we will manage. And I don't know. Maybe we won't build an armory after all in Karakadron. Maybe we'll build the other recruitment building so that we can get, like, ballistas and catapults and stuff. All right. We've finished our heavy current stones. Beards in belts. Beards in belts. I guess that prevents you from tripping over your belt or your beard. All right. So next turn we will have just enough money for the upgrade and just enough population to do it. What do we get by upgrading this building? We get access to quarrelers and eventually long beards, which are a hundred armor, forty-eight defense. Wow, very very tough. They have the old grumblers trait. Can I? No, we cannot pin that. And there's none of them in the garrison, unfortunately. All right. Well, I don't think there's a way for me to know what that trait does until I actually have one of those units, which is kind of a bummer. Do I want to try to run up here? They have two armies at about half size each. We have no idea what the composition of this one is. It could be all biggins. It might not be worth trying to run up here and potentially save Kazadur Kalaz. All right. What else do we want? Uh, obviously, we're having some public order problems. There's a public order tech here. Some diplomatic stuff. Additional growth from our growth commandment. That's pretty cool. Even more public order. Okay, so this is looking like a place that we might want to head. 
Uh, what about actual unit buffs? So it seems like the top half is all economic stuff and the bottom half is all unit stuff. Uh, a very, very small recruitment cost uh, bonus is kind of crappy. Actual extra combat stats are a lot better. Five leadership for all dwarf infantry units. Although remember that leadership has no effect on slayers. Miners. Okay. These are... These are some okay skills. They're all very, very small in effect. I think... Okay, 10% weapon strength for all dwarf units with hand weapons. That's pretty significant. But I kind of think I want to focus on economic stuff first. The buffs from all of these skills are so small. Eh, this is a little bit better. Plus, recruit rank is nice. Uh, your, your individual units do have levels. They will get XP during battle and level up, and the levels do affect their stats. Plus 10% missile damage for all ranged units is pretty cool, too. Let's focus on public order. We're having public order issues. We have a solution being offered to us for that. We should take it. And we definitely don't want to do any recruitment. Yes. I'm going to move all the way in here, though. I think up here we're still well out of attack range for them. And here we have some options for how to respond based on what they do. I'm pretty sure they can't get to us. And you can see this, uh, this little red area on the ground around a settlement or an army indicates their reinforcement range. As it stands right now, we would not reinforce Khazad Urkulaz if it was attacked, and that's exactly what I want. If you're within reinforcement range of a settlement when the settlement gets attacked, uh, that can be really bad for you if you're not prepared to actually fight. As far as I'm aware, there's no way to not aid a settlement that you control if it's attacked, if you're within the range. Okay, the major dwarf faction has confederated Jufbar. So what that means is that uh, the Jufbar is out of the game entirely. They gave all of their stuff to the faction that is called Dwarfs, which is a terrible name for a faction, given that there are multiple factions of dwarves. Uh, and then, in response, the Vampire Counts immediately declared war on them. So I wonder if the Vampires were at war with Jufbar to start with. Maybe that's why that minor um, orc clan was so successful against them, was because some of their armies had been killed by vampires. Alright, Red Eye is... Okay, they're scouting Khazad so they're probably going to attack it soon. They're trying to make sure that we don't have an army in defensive position. But it turns out we do. So honestly, like, even the presence of this army may be enough to ward off their attack, which means Khazad Urkulaz will keep generating money for us. Uh, which obviously is somewhat valuable. I don't think it's a big deal, but I, I would prefer having the money over not having the money. Okay. It is really, really important throughout the early game to continue improving things at home. So we have four turns before we need to make another recruitment decision. The more I think about it, the more I'm leaning toward just picking up the Siege Workshop and getting access to catapults. So bolt throwers are better for fighting uh, large enemies, horses, uh, big monster stuff, the giant spiders that the orcs will eventually be able to recruit. While catapults are way better at just crushing infantry, we'll probably get some catapults. So how much does that building cost? That's only 2,500. Okay, as it stands right now, we will, in four turns, have 2,500 money. So I'm a little bit... A little bit loath to attempt to, um... To recruit anymore. One thing we could go for here is we could have our runesmith try to wound this goblin. What are the odds of that working? Uh... More likely to work than not, but unfortunately it costs money to do that, and we cannot, uh, we cannot fund his expedition at the moment. What? So, we have to make a choice here. If I think he's going to bring just this one army forward, probably the smart thing to do would be to move into Khazad Urkulaz's reinforcement range, and then go into ambush mode. If our, uh, hide roll is successful, 
They'll completely lose track of us, think the settlement is open to be taken, run forward, and then have to deal with both our army and the settlement's army coming in as reinforcements. That's a battle that we totally might win. I don't want to say that I'm confident we'd win, but we might win. If they're going to bring both their armies forward, uh, we should probably just back off. Wait a minute. Ornery Backslider and Snide Bogroff. Oh, okay. So when we when we originally got this quest, it was an army being led by an orc named Olog. What happened is Ornery Backslider recovered from being wounded after we beat him in that battle, and they kicked Olog out of this army and made Ornery Backslider the general instead. I was gonna say, we don't see Olog's army here, they might have three stacks. <laughs> I know I'm kind of just running back and forth a lot, but now I'm wondering if it's a good idea for us to be up here at all. You know what? We're out of reinforcement range. How about we do this? Yes. Let's go into ambush stance right here. If they go after the settlement, they go after the settlement and they take it. If they only send one army to do that, though, we can probably pounce on that army and defeat it after the battle. We'll see if that works out. They might be content to just sit there and raid forever. Who knows? At some point, that's also going to be a problem for us. We are suffering some pretty severe public uh, public order penalties here in Kazadurkalaz. Well, I guess I have to I have to go back and make sure we're not going to have a rebellion spawn outside Karak Kadron too, don't I? For right now, we're just buying time while we develop military technology back home. Honestly, this might be a good time, and in fact, maybe I should have done it on this previous turn, to remove the growth building that's in the minor settlement and replace it with a money building. Okay. Oh, that's annoying. Their hero saw through our ambush and then managed to wound our runesmith. Okay, and they moved an army to here and set it into ambush mode, and then moved their army forwards. So they're trying to goad me into attacking them, and if that works, then they'll have uh, they'll have their ambush army come in as reinforcements. It is a total bummer that we lost our runesmith. How many turns is he wounded for? Five. Ugh. All right. That's a shame. That guy was useful. Well, they failed their hide roll, even though they're super far away from us, because they're just really not that sneaky. And you can see what this Skull and Crossbones here means is that they are they are standing in a location that is not conducive to survival. Yeah, so quite a few units of biggins between the two armies. I am the Slayer King. Maybe we should just fall back. Actually, we should definitely fall back because we're going to have a rebellion. Yes, my oath is intact. Onward to death. Uh, the rebellions will appear outside the minor or outside the major settlement in a in a region if you have the major settlement. So let's head back to Karak Kadron and deal with that. So now I'm thinking we won't be able to afford to do another settlement improvement for a while so this is maybe a time where we could we could get rid of this undeveloped barley field we'll get back about half of what we paid for it and then we can replace it with a uh, with a money building maybe we got to tier three that was the thing I was most worried about this is just gonna be a problem for a while well I'm glad I didn't declare a war on the orcs to our south we probably cannot handle another war here And honestly, just a huge amount of what's happening right here comes down to losing as many units as we lost in that auto-resolve. Without those losses, we could probably have replenished and at least threatened the final settlement. Maybe we could have uh, could have attacked and taken it. And if we had all this territory and no armies to our north to deal with, we'd be in a phenomenal place.
Unfortunately, like, the auto-resolve behaves in the way that it behaves because it's not attempting to simulate the battles or anything, it's just doing some very simple math. Because all AI versus AI combat is done by the auto-resolver, and if it actually ran a full battle simulation for each one of those fights, obviously it would take forever for the enemy turn to happen. Yeah, this is what I was afraid of. What is that, eight units of, uh, no, seven units of, of biggins? So we're going to go ahead and hit our resolve there, because there's no version of that where we do any meaningful damage to them. That's probably going to be a grudge. I'm assuming. Hmm. They've run that army way out away from the other one. I wonder if we have the movement range necessary to catch these guys. Because they're in march mode, so they're tired. They can't retreat, and they've taken attrition damage from moving through all those mountain passes. We might be able to snipe that army and leave them in a very weakened, leave that whole faction in a very weakened position that we could then take great advantage of. Okay, so we finished this tech. We have, in fact, acquired a new grudge. You know, upsides and downsides here. Uh, we've also... Okay, we've acquired two new grudges. Hold on, we'll look at those in a second. What we need to keep an eye on is our severity. So each of these grudges has a base severity level, and then uh, that will increase with age. Oof. Alright. So because we, lost, uh, because we lost the hold, we have to take it back. And then because a lot of stuff has happened to us that has been done by greenskins, we got to win some battles against the greenskins to get our uh, to get our honor back. If the severity value, if our total severity increases to above nine, it's going to start seriously hurting us. And if it were to get above nineteen, it would be even worse. That said, uh, every grudge is a chance to get a bundle of rewards. So here's hoping we can turn this around on them a little bit. Very well. This may work. It does look like we could grab these guys. So this army is a little bit more goblin heavy. Man, it would be really nice if I still had my damn runesmith. Here's my concern. If we do manage to win this, to run up here and win this battle, is Snide Bogroff gonna have the movement speed necessary to engage on us immediately afterward? Because we'll definitely be in a weakened state, right? Like, this is gonna be a hard fight. God, especially with our Rune Lord being damaged. That really sucked. Alright, let's get him. I think we can get him. Game thinks we'll get him too. So they only have three units of biggins. That's great for us, because that means we can each unit of biggins can be uh, met face to face by a unit of dwarf warriors. Dwarf warriors have 22 attack, 40 defense, 28 weapon strength. So a lot less dangerous in actual combat than the orc biggins and what this symbol here indicates is that they do bonus damage versus large this is not a big concern to us they do have a fair amount of armor piercing damage but the majority of their damage that 29 is going to be reduced tremendously by our 85 armor i think we can do this we got to be careful of the poison attacks of the night goblin archers and these normal night goblins despite despite not having very good attack uh attack stats do inflict that poison debuff with every one of their normal melee attacks. Fortunately, they have 15 defense and should be pretty uh, pretty easy to destroy. If we can kill this army and then not get immediately attacked by their other army on their next turn, this is going to put us in a very good position for actually breaking them down. They should not have separated their armies so much. It's a, what I would describe as a major strategic blunder. Sort of like clicking the auto-resolve button was for us. Plus, this will be worth some, mo some money and some XP. This will help with our economy. Winning battles is a really, really good way to power up your economy in this game. They're all tired. It should not be terribly difficult to, uh, to break their morale. And we do have to remember that Ornery Backslider himself is a wizard. He's going to try to stay back from the battle and cast all kinds of annoying spells. And we are probably going to have to have Ungram hunt him. 
Normally, this is the kind of thing that I would assign like a light cavalry unit to, but uh, we're dwarves and we don't have cavalry. I'm pretty sure dwarves never get cavalry. I don't think they. Uh, I don't think dwarves have any fast-moving units of any kind. Now, if we lose this battle, it'll be bad, but it might not be. It might not be terrible. If we lose the battle without dealing any significant damage to this army, then the army will just sweep into our uh, our minor settlement nearby and annihilate it, and that will be that'll be like, how did you lose the game already? Type bad. But if we lose this in kind of a stalemate way, and they don't have the force necessary to hit that garrison immediately, then we probably can still hold it. It'll take long enough for the other army, to, their other army, to get into position that we might be able to still hold it. I don't know. Let's not plan for failure just yet. Now, obviously, we want to take advantage of the superior range of our ranged units. And I'm going to try to set these guys up a little bit more intelligently than I have in the past. So where are their... Their biggins are lined up mostly on the left, it looks like, so we probably... want to put all of our dwarf warriors over here. You can see uh, proper dwarf warriors... Uh, exhibit a much greater level of discipline and training than the Slayers, who are just kind of in a loose pack. Alright, we don't really want to run in front of the Thunderers, is mostly what I'm thinking here. And we do want Ungram Iron Fist on the actual front lines, because he's very slow. Let me turn off the unit card, buy us a little bit more screen real estate, and honestly, let's just go forward, right? This big rock is kind of awkward. These are the range units over here. Alright, don't run. Take it easy. They're tired and we're not. And that does affect their melee stats. So if we just, if we approach slowly, save up our vigor, uh, because they're tired because they were in march mode. Now keep in mind their army looks a little bit smaller than it actually is because we currently cannot see the night goblins. Night goblins are very sneaky. We could probably fast forward this a little bit. <laughs> keep an eye on the firing cones and we're going to change up our orders a little bit. You can see below, when I'm holding space like this, below their morale bar is an indicator of their vigor. Our Vigor is nice and high and climbing. Their Vigor is not only low, but it's actually capped. It's, uh, it's capped at a nice low value. So we really want to actually focus our, uh, our Quarrelers on Night Goblins where possible. For right now, we'll give them another target. It's better for us to attack the boys because the boys have uh, considerably lower armor. Actually, the boys have shields, though. Uh, what shields actually do is they uh, they just make 35% of all small arms fire not happen. So actually it's probably better for us to focus on the biggins then. Even though we'll be doing somewhat less damage, all of the uh, all the missiles will actually hit. And then the Thunderers have armor piercing missiles, but I don't think that they... I don't think that they ignore shields. Yeah, our damage isn't super high, but it is... Almost entirely armor-piercing. It's weird that, that that says 20, but the two numbers were given are 5 and 17. You know what, I guess I'll have you guys attack these biggins too. The quicker we get the biggins out of the battle, the easier it's going to be. But we will prefer to target the night goblins as soon as they become visible. Okay, which kind? Ah, alright. That is a Night Goblin ranged unit. That is, in fact, the priority target. And you can see, very effective. Uh, Night Goblins have no no armor or shields to speak of, the, the ranged units anyway. Should we maybe not move forward? Hold up. Hold up. Why don't we all just stop? Everybody halt. Uh, maybe not everybody. You guys still have a little bit of marching you can do. But right now we're outranging them and they're not getting to fire back. Let's make them walk into us a little bit. Hold on. Hold on. 
I kind of can't believe they're not gonna... Are they really just gonna let us do this? You can see the, uh, the firing arc for their units on the ground here. Okay, here it is. Well, they lost almost an entire uh, unit of of archers before finally deciding to attack. So that's a pretty successful opening for us. Okay, now it's on, though. So I need each of you to pick a unit of biggins and get involved. These slayers are going to run around the side here, hopefully. And these slayers are, in, are pretty much just in direct run forth and do damage. And we probably want to try to weave Ungrim through the enemies to get to Ornery Backslider, but you know what? He's also just really good at hacking dudes up. That's a fine thing. If he gets caught, if he gets caught and has to murder a bunch of orcs, that's not the worst thing in the world. Let's see how the battle unfolds a little bit before we decide which direction he needs to run in. Alright, let's see if we can get him around the, the inside of this group over here. I'm pretty sure that if the Thunderers don't have a target they can actually shoot, they just um, don't shoot. So we want to make sure that they are... Uh... This is the unit of Slayers. We probably don't want you guys to be directly involved. Yeah, I think the Thunderers will, would, would re just wait for an open shot on the Night Goblin Archers rather than shooting into these boys, so we, I think we have to tell them manually to shoot at the boys. And actually, I think this is the path. I'm going to try to snipe their lord. See if we can pull that off. Alright, I do believe he has, uh, he has come forth. He has fallen for it. Our lord's under attack. He's taking some shots in the back, I think, from our own guys. Alright, let's make sure that we're giving actual orders here. So these biggins, you can see, are losing tremendously. It is not good to have to fight from two sides, and it's especially not good when the thing hitting you in the back is something as damage-focused as, uh, as a unit of Slayers. Over here, Orc Boys versus Slayers, I think we've seen that this is uh, a win for us usually, but I'm going to make sure that we're actually trying to focus our damage on the Night Goblins as much as possible, because if anything's going to turn this tide in favor of the Orcs, it's all of our guys being poisoned, right? And this is actually totally working. Let's make sure we pop his uh, pop his skill the moment he gets engaged. You can see they're trying to cast some magic on him. Dude's panicking a little bit. Wow, that's a good initial hit. All right, their lord is wavering. He's losing his goblin wizard versus the Slayer King is not a not a good fight for goblin wizard. Okay, they're gonna they're gonna lose a lot of morale there. It looks like we've got a pretty open shot here. Corlers are gonna kind of ruin it. Step them out to the side. Should be able to get this shot. Then Ungrim's got his flank on. Yeah, we've totally enveloped them over here. Their morale is just about shattering. Did you stop attacking? Get get in there. Sometimes uh, there's a bug where sometimes units lose track of their orders when the situation changes, like if enemies move away from them. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been fixed or not. Like I said in the first episode, I haven't played the game in uh, several months because I was waiting for this patch. Hopefully that is somewhat fixed. It looks like we've got them mostly in retreat. As soon as these units break down. Okay, there it is. That's the end of the battle. And because the army was in march stance, none of these units will successfully retreat. They're too tired to run away. So it is assumed that our army uh, picks them all off as they flee. That was really successful. Very, very good for us. A decisive victory. The corpses of the enemy litter the ground, and those still able to flee do so with the laughter of our gods ringing in their ears. So yeah, we'll see a uh, we'll see an actual casualties during battle number here, and then the army will just be deleted when we get back to the map because they were unable to get away. Uh, only thirteen kills for the Slayer King, but one of those was very very important. So we've defeated Ornery Backslider in battle before, and in fact, 
Ungram Iron Fist has personally defeated Ornery Backslider in battle before. Every time a lord, the leader of an army, goes down in battle, there's a chance that they'll simply be wounded and a chance that they'll be actually killed. Uh, legendary lords, like Ungram Iron Fist, basically any, any character you can pick as your starting character, uh, cannot be killed, will always only be wounded. Fortunately for us, Ornery Backslider is not such a character. We may actually have, uh, we may actually have, have removed him from the game here. I guess that wouldn't be that big of a ben uh, 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 mm, that big of a benefit to us because he's probably like only level two or whatever. Like, it's not like this is a good leader that we've removed. We did some good work here. We're in pretty good shape, actually. Only a couple of our units took significant damage, so they have left one army that is roughly like two or three uh, units bigger than ours. We might be able to do this. We might be able to actually break the red eye down over the next episode or two. It would be really nice to hold all of that land. It would, in particular, be really nice to hold a province adjacent to Kislev. Because obviously Kislev's going to have no love for the red eye. The fact that we have uh, fought the red eye a lot and killed a lot of their dudes is going to endear us to the Kislevites. And the Kislevites have money and trade goods. Is taking a remarkably long time to load out of battle. So with 900 and or with uh, 700 dwarves remaining, we can probably get this army healed back up into a state where all of the units are capable of fighting again, in like one or two turns of friendly region replenishment, and we can use those one or two turns to do a little bit of hiring. I may delay the building of the siege weapon, or the yeah the building of the siege weapon building if it will allow us to actually just wipe out the Red Eye's other remaining army uh, in the next few turns, which it looks like maybe is a situation that we can uh, we can put together here. Boy, the very end of this loading must be just incredibly difficult. The bar, the bar has been here or later for almost all of the time that we've been on this loading screen. So I do want to caution, uh, it's very easy to have things go a certain way all game and get used to that, but it's important for me to remember, and so I'm going to say it out loud, that not all the f all the enemies we fight will be so easy to, uh, to morale out. Orcs and goblins have particularly bad leadership, uh, they're very easy to make flee. When we start fighting vampires and stuff, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Obviously, we are not interested in releasing captives. We couldn't take a penalty to our replenishment rate anyway. The leadership buff is pretty insignificant, although at this point only about half of our army is slayers, so it does do something for half of our army. And yeah, you can see that entire army is defeated. And we've accomplished one of our, uh, one of our grudges. We've got some oath gold. We've got a leadership buff, another leadership buff for about half of our army. The Slayer in me seeks death. Uh, and we are just going to keep moving toward uh, Lightning Strike, right? Casualty replenishment rate plus 30% for just the Lord in this army. So Ungram will basically always be at full health uh, going into a battle. Seems pretty alright. Alright, so we have Willbreaker. I'm not really interested in expanding the attrition suffered by defenders when lay laying siege. Once you've gotten to the attrition part, that that's over. So yeah, we'll finish off Miner's Instinct. Next level we can take Iron Wield, and after that we can get Lightning Strike, which I think is really valuable. I don't think you need to get it on all of your lords, but it's very, very good to have one, at least one. So his army is 14 units, and we know that seven of them are biggins. It's certainly going to be more difficult. Alright. Let's go into march mode so that we have enough movement to get back on our side of the line so that we can take replenishment. And I feel really good about the direction that this is headed now. Uh, so let's see. The other public order benefits are behind scrutinized guild leaders. Dwarven diplomats will give us... Okay, I mean... Kislev is a human faction, so if we intend to establish trade, it's probably a good idea to get this before we actually meet them. And then over here, okay, an additional benefit. Humans, High Elves, and Lizardmen are sort of like the, uh, 
if you were to divide all the races in Warhammer Fantasy into good and evil, these are the races that are on the good-ish side. See, so yeah, we do need this extra public order stuff, but let's pick up... Well, how many turns do I think it's going to be before I meet Kislev? Now, let's get to Dwarven Diplomats. It totally could be within the next, like, five turns or something, depending on how all this stuff breaks down. So let's try to be ready for it. And we're still just accumulating money. We are going to be well over the 2500 that we needed for our siege building. Oh, but I was going to do this. Yeah, this pays for itself pretty quickly. Even if it delays our siege building by one turn, this is this is worth doing. Okay, and I think that is going to be where we end the episode for today. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, I do want to say the way this series is going to work generally is that there is going to be one episode every weekday. Uh, I'm uploading one on Saturday today because I didn't upload one yesterday because I hung out with my friends and played Jackbox games instead. Uh, pastime that I highly recommend. So come back Monday for the next episode to see if we can finally put this red-eye menace to, be uh, to bed. And we'll see you then.